Good morning. We welcome you to First Conyers this morning. We are so happy that you are here with us. Let's go ahead and stand this morning. We are here to worship him. He is so worthy. And through all of it, one thing has remained the same, and that is who he is and his faithfulness. And holy, holy, holy Lord God.
you father father you are holy god father we look forward to that day where we will stand in your presence and day and night we will never stop singing holy 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 father we love you you are worthy to be praised in your holy name we pray amen you may be seated well good morning it is good to be together to worship this morning. Would you say amen to that? Uh, what a declaration in that old hymn, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And then uh, the, the clear statement, God in three persons, blessed Trinity, and we worship Him as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Before we look at the passage this morning, we're going to be looking at in the book of Jude as we continue there, beginning in verse 8 through 13. You can go ahead and turn there and get ready uh, for that. But I want to make just a few announcements to make you aware of. Men, we've been uh, encouraging you to be a part of the different men's revivals that are taking place. And beginning tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. nightly at Solid Rock Baptist Church in Covington, there will be revival meetings that will begin, be nightly. We encourage you to be a part of that. You can find information on that on our website, uh, 6 p.m. every evening it begins. And then on August the 21st, there is a What's at Steak dinner. It's a men's steak dinner. Uh, that will be encouraged and challenged at the same time. Those tickets are available. You can register through our website or through our Facebook page. And so, man, I encourage you to be a part of that. Uh, then last week, I had made an announcement of what, uh, what our anticipated plans are for the fall, beginning on that Sunday, uh, September the 13th, where we'll look to open up small groups on campus. And so we're asking you to help give us information as to what you will be able to participate in so we can plan for numbers and uh, lay out the expected social distancing that we need to do that. And then our Wednesday evening groups will begin meeting that Wednesday the 16th. So please go on to our website uh, and register. That doesn't mean that you can't come if you don't register, but it gives us an idea of what to plan for, and it would help us out a lot. And then lastly, Blake and Jamie uh, Cutter, Blake, our student pastor, you know the situation he's been having with, with Beckett, the little child brain a damage to birth, and today we're going to receive a love offering for them, and there'll be a area you can deposit that in the lobby as you leave, and for me and for my family, this is going to be above and beyond what our normal giving is, uh, just a sacrifice to help them meet the expenses that they've incurred of having to go back and forth to St. Mary's and having to eat fast food and all of those things, so express your love to them if you're able by giving part of that, uh, that love offering today for them. I got a text from Blake this morning, and he was going to be here today, but Beckett had begun having seizures through the night again last night, and they can't get those under control. So he and Jamie were headed to the hospital this morning. Uh, so please be in prayer for them. I know that you are. Uh, if you have a note of encouragement you want to send to them, uh, do that, a text, uh, but just continue to pray for them. Well, this morning we're looking at Jude verses 8 through 13. And I've been telling you that these sermons in June are, are not typically what, what I would call uh, messages on how to win friends and influence people, right? Uh, well, hopefully we're influenced by the Word of God, but there's some hard writing that Jude writes to that church as he's expressing what he uh, signifies in it, that it was an urgent letter that he was writing to them. 
he had intentions of writing another lengthy letter to maybe encourage them and who they are in Christ and the faith, we're not quite sure. But the, the need that was so pressing at that time was that there were those who had crept into the body of Christ. Uh, the literal translation of that word crept, they had wormed their way into the body of Christ. They were from among those believers and they were teaching false doctrine. They had departed from the teachings of, of the apostles, they had departed from the teachings of the Scriptures as it being God's Word, and they were considered to be apostate. Apostate is one who walks away from the faith, and Jude is writing these believers and telling them, listen, you must contend for the faith the canonization and the, the accumulation of those things that make up the essence of the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and the sovereign God. And so he says they had infiltrated, they had twisted and perverted the grace of God, meaning that they had taken advantage, if you will, of God's grace saying that God is gracious and whatever you might want to do as a follower, it's okay. It really doesn't matter what God says in His Word. Maybe they're just suggestions, but he's saying they perverted the grace of God, and Paul writes of that in Romans, in the fact that because God grace abounds, should we then go on sinning? And Paul says, heavens, no. They're there for us to follow, that, that God's law has not changed. God's always been a God of grace, and He always will be a God of grace. But that does not give us as believers a license to do whatever we want to do. And my goodness, if we haven't seen at any time, we see in this time in the body of Christ, I think in America in particular, that we've exploited the grace of God and we say, yeah, God's gracious, but let's just go out and live the way we want to live. There's no transformed life when you come to Christ. But can I say this, that when one comes to know Christ, when there's truly a born-again heart, there is a transformation of life that begins. How many of you can attest to that? in your own life. And it's not because we start doing things by our own effort to make that transform life, but it's the Holy Spirit of God who begins to change our heart, and we see the truth of God's Word, we see the truth of who He is, and we respond to Him in a lifestyle of worship that we obey the Word of God. We, we desire to live that Christ life. But they had departed from the truth of the Word of God. And he uses examples back in Old Testament history to relate how these apostates, just like these Old Testament examples, had departed from the truth of God. And we looked at these a couple of weeks ago, how the children of Israel had departed and rebelled against the Word of God. How that in that, in that day, the angels, he goes back all the way to the heavens when, when Satan himself wanted the worship and the honor and the glory that God alone deserves. He rebelled against God and also how the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah had rebelled against God. But in all three of those instances, he recounts for us the fact that where they rebelled against God, there also in response to that was a judgment of God when they rebelled against God. And so too, just as these Old Testament examples brought about a judgment from God, so it would be in the life of these apostates, these heretics who had departed from the truth that God's judgment would come. So picking up in verse 18, let me, uh, excuse me, verse 8, let me just read the, the, the first couple of verses here because he begins to display or write about what the character of these apostates are. A couple of weeks ago, I, I gave some examples of individuals in our, in our nation, in America, in particular, that, that I would consider apostates. They've departed from the faith, the truth of the gospel, departed from the Word of God to give their own ideas only to build up their own power, their own kingdom, and exploit the people for their own purses. That's just the bottom line, and that's what Jude's going to go into here. He says in verse 8, he describes them this way, he says, yet in like manner, referring to those examples that he had just given, in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh. They reject authority and they blaspheme, blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael contended with the devil, 
disputing over the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. He says, but these people, meaning those who had had turned from God, turned away from the Word of God, the truth of God, these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by that like manner. Like unreasoning animals understand instinctively. So, let's back up to verse 8. He says, yet in like manner, and I think in context, what, what Jude is referring to is in like manner, just as the men in Sodom and Gomorrah had gone to Lot's house, not realizing maybe that they were angels that had come to Lot's house, but the, the, the city had become so perverse that the men stood at Lot's door and they were banging on the door, and because of their degradation, they had become so distorted by that, they desired to have sex with these men, and Lot, trying to turn them away, says, hey man, I've got virgin daughters, take them instead, yet they still wanted to do that. And he says, in Lot like manner also these men. And so we see in these men, these apostates, that that there is a perversion that takes place. And at the core and at the root of that is a perversion to satisfy and gratify their own depraved nature. He says, in like manner, and then he says, relying on their dreams. Now, we're not exactly sure what, what Jude meant by this uh, because we can't recount the fact that God does speak to man through dreams. We have numerous accounts of that uh, throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament so, as well. And it's prophesied that in the, in the church age that, that God will speak through dreams, but what they have seemed to be doing is that they applied their dreams as a, as a source of divine revelation. You see, God has given us divine revelation through the Word of God, Amen. not to be added to and not to be taken from. But these men and their arrogance and their pride had the speculation that their dreams would usurp the authority of the Word of God, and they would take their dreams and they would apply them to lead others away in that. Now, do I believe that the Scripture teaches that God still and can speak through dreams? Yes. However, as God may speak to man through dreams... We need to be very cautious and very careful because God will never speak in that way that will contradict what the Word of God has said. And so we find today it's very prevalent in some of the movements, particularly in what the Word of Faith movement is and the the modern prophecy movement that's going on, that there are men and leaders that are claiming that their prophecies supersede the Scriptures. And can I tell you, nowhere will you find that in Scripture. And so he says they they use their dreams for source of divine revelation. And also, it seems to be that Jude is saying they use their dreams in order to justify their perverse lifestyles. Let me ask you a question. It's hard to argue against someone saying, God told me. Can I say this? God has told us. You see, we have to be very careful because the enemy is so crafty and deceptive, and even the truest of believers can be led away into what I call some of these weird forms of leading where they begin to be led by dreams. Why do we need that? God has given us all that we need to know in Scripture as He has revealed it to us by the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. There's a balance in that, okay? So don't hear me. Don't hear me wrong. Don't hear me saying that God never speaks. He can. But can I tell you this, that we have to be very careful, and it must line up with what the Word of God says. And don't be led astray by those who seem to have a high spiritual, uh, like they've got a, a front row seat in the kingdom of God, and God only speaks to them through dreams. Can I tell you, they are wolves in sheep's clothing looking to scatter the sheep and slaughter them. He says they defile the the flesh. That's the next example. 
And I think in context, he's referring directly to their sexual sins, the perversion of what God's intent was in the beauty of human sexuality. Can anybody say human sexuality in the confines of God's plan is glorious? Can I get an amen to that, or are you too embarrassed to say that? Boy, y'all are sheepish. God has given it as a gift. This is PG-13. I think y'all are old enough to handle it. But outside of that, outside of God's prescription in that, it is a damnable thing in the life of a believer and a follower. We see the consequences so much in culture of that. And then he goes on to say they reject authority. What they're doing here is they deny God's lordship, and they also deny God's authority within the body of Christ. Because they had come against, if you will, the apostles' teaching. As God, through Paul and Peter and the other apostles, had, had given divine revelation that we have in the canon of Scripture, they defied the authority that was there as God had inspired His Word through these men. And at the core of this, at the root of their heart, they desired a power, they desired a control over others where they, would, uh, where they would misapply, thwart, deny the authority that God had placed not only in the apostles but also in the church. Now, it, I know this can be abused, and it is abused, but quite frankly, God has lined out for us in the body of Christ authority that God Himself has meted out and has given. Now, let me underline it very carefully. That authority that God has given to pastors, to elders, can often and is often abused. How many of you have been in a place where that has been the circumstance? Okay? You see, power left unchecked almost always leads to abuse. But God has designed the authority in the body of Christ so that there is a leadership and authority that God has given. It doesn't mean that that authority at times can't be questioned in the sense of, is this right? As a matter of fact, we should question authority, right? And, and I underline that by saying that all authority must have accountability around them. You and I will never rise to the situation or the place in authority that we should not be accountable to others in our lives. Can you say amen to that? You know why I want to be accountable as a pastor? Because I know in a New York second, if you're from New York, I hope that didn't offend you. But in a New York second, my flesh can rail up, and I can abuse the authority in the, in the place that God has given me as a pastor. Amen to that? So, authority is always under authority. Peter reminds us that, that we are shepherds, but we are under the authority of the great shepherd. And let me tell you, I fear his authority much more than I do any other authority, Right? And so these individuals had set themselves up where, where they were not in, in the, under authority of anyone. Listen to what Peter writes in a similar passage in chapter 2, verse 21 of the book of 2 Peter. He says this, speaking of, of those who would be apostates. He says, for it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment derived to them. In other words, hey, it would have been a whole lot better for them had they, had they not known, in verse 1 of that same passage, he says this, But false prophets also arise among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies and even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. Not only do they ignore the, uh, the apostolic authority that was there in the early church, but they deny the lordship of the master himself. Can you imagine that? That's a grave place to be in. And he says they, they, they blaspheme the glorious ones. And just as God has set in order in the body of Christ a, a, a role in authority, 
And I would like to say that it's accountable authority. It has to be accountable. These individuals also blaspheme the glorious one. And God has an order of authority in all of creation. And he has created the angels really in that sense of being greater than man. That's his, his order of authority. Now, what was going on that they blasphemed angels, he does not go into account as to what they did. But evidently, they were speaking against what the role and authority in God's created order would have been, and they blasphemed angels. We get a little bit more insight. If you flip over again to Second Peter, you might as well put your finger there because we're going to go back and forth. Peter says this in verses 10 and 11. He's describing them as they, they indulge in the lust of defiling passion and, and despise authority. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. In other words, the angels know their place. They allow God to pronounce judgment. They don't pronounce it themselves. In other words, they stay in their lane of authority. And so these individuals had gone outside of that, and in going outside of that, they have gone against God himself. Now, we come to verse 9, and he uses this as, as to build the case where they blaspheme uh, the angelic beings, the glorious ones, to give an example of where even Michael the archangel did not step out of his role of authority when confronted by Satan. Verse 9, let's read this. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous, ju blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Now, we find the account, just to give a little background, in Deuteronomy chapter 34, of when Moses had died, the Scriptures tell us that, that God Himself had taken Moses in the valley, and God had buried the body of Moses. No other person was around when that happened. God himself buried Moses. But here Jude recounts what, what was a historical tradition among the Jews, and some note that it was, it was in the apocryphal book, The Assumption of Moses, and maybe he's drawing from that account, but there was an instance when, when at that time, after God had buried Moses, that Michael the archangel, who is the highest of all the angels did battle with Satan over the body of Moses. Now, this, can, this verse can really just throw you off. And I kind of take it this way. There are a lot of theories around where Jude is getting this information. And I kind of take it literally as we read Scripture literally, unless the Bible tells us otherwise, that, that Jude is given the account of what had taken place, what, that which had not been recorded in Old Testament, but that's not the first time that happens in Scripture. There are other examples of that taking place. And so here, Moses and the devil are fighting over the body of Moses. And one might ask the question, why would be, they be fighting over the body of Moses. Well, can I give you two propositions, I think, that, that may be clear as to why they were fighting over the body of Moses? Number one is this. If Moses' body had been exhumed by the children of Israel because he was so revered by the nation of Israel, what do you think probably would have happened in that day? They would have revered and made a, a, an altar out of the body of Moses, and they would have bowed down and kissed it, and idolatry would have set in in that place, and they would have worshipped Moses. My goodness, we think we have the shroud of Torah, the actual linen cloth that wrapped Jesus. And what do you see individuals doing? They become worshipers of that rather than worshipers of God. And so that's one theory of what may have taken place. I think the other one may have been, in fact, though, 
is that God had a plan for Moses. And we have to fast forward to Revelation chapter 11. You see, the ministry of Moses had not yet ceased. God did not allow him to go into the promised land. But God was going to use Moses. If you remember, there are two witnesses that are found in the book of Revelation in chapter 11. When God's dealing with the nation of Israel, and they will go in the streets of Israel, and they will be preaching God's God's judgment that's to come, God's love, and His God's grace, and God's mercy, and pleading with them, please accept Christ as Messiah. It's very clear, I think, in Revelation 11 that those two individuals that are witnesses are Elijah and Moses, and Satan has always wanted to thwart God's plan. You see, he thought he had won the victory when Christ was crucified and laid in the tomb. (laughs) (laughs) he had no clue that God was going to raise him from the dead. Amen? And so it's probably likely that this is what Jude is referring to. But the point is, is that even Michael, the archangel, did not presume upon himself to have an authority that had not been given to him by God. And he said, I'm, even though I'm the archangel, I'm not going to rebuke you, Satan, but the Lord rebuke you. And he understood that there was a lane that he was to stay in, and he stayed in that lane, indicating that there were those who were these apostates that had stepped outside, either through pride or arrogance or greed, all of the above, to try to usurp authority that God had never given to them. Verse 10, he says this, but these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Listen to what Peter says using this this same kind of illustration of false teachers. He says in verse 12 of chapter 2, but these like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheme about matters of which they are ignorant will also be destroyed in their destruction. What are they saying? These guys are acting just like animals. When you look at animals, they, there's that instinct of survival, and, and, and you have that, that, that they, will, they will lose their mind in some way in order to destroy and gratify to get what they need. It's by instinct And he's making the comparison that these apostates will devour acting like animals, not giving any regard whatsoever to those that they are destroying through their false teachings. Then he begins to give a triad of woes in verses 11 to 13. And we're going to come back to those. But but first I want to lay out and just talk briefly about the description of of, of their danger to the body, where he begins in verse 12. He, he says that these apostates are like this. They are hidden reefs. You, you get the picture of, of, of the ocean. I don't know if you've ever done any ocean time or if you're at the lake, and there's that stump that's under the water that you don't see, and you come creaming by in your ski boat at 40 miles an hour, and what's going to happen to your boat, Arthur? <laughs> right? It's just going to be destroyed. They're, they're like hidden reefs below the surface. In other words, they are a hidden danger that's there. And when, when we're just traveling along the water, we don't realize that there's a reef there, and that reef will bring absolute destruction to the vessel that we're riding in. He, he goes on to say, they're at your love feasts, your love feast, as they feast with you without fear. This word love feast refers to what they did in the early church in their time of communion, like we're going to have communion today at the close of our service. And Paul writes of, of the, the, the perversion of the love feast in, in his letter to Corinth, and, and the result of some of them that were, that were violating the purpose of communion as a remembrance of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, His bloodshed and His body broken, and they were indulging in their own sensual lust over, over gluttony and, and all of the other that was going along with it. And he says, listen, 
They, they, these guys, they, they join you in your love feast. And what was the purpose of the love feast? The love feast, communion, was a time to remember the Lord Jesus Christ and His payment, His sacrifice made for our sins, and to memorialize that and always keep it before the body in that. And it was a time of fellowship for the body as we commune with God through the Lord's Supper. He says they're in your midst there, and, and they seem to have no fear. In other words, they're, they're disregarding the whole purpose of the command, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me, and they have no fear of rejecting. They have no fear of disobeying what the Lord Jesus Christ Himself had said, that what they're to do there. They are shepherds feeding themselves. They're called to be the shepherd of the body. They're called to be those who would care for the flock, who would, who would care for them through the teaching and the instruction of the Word of God, that would care for them in prayer, that would care for them in spiritual guidance. They were called to do that, but what they are are those that are only out to feed themselves. Do you ever see that? Have you ever seen that of those that you would recognize as apostates? Got some oil, I'll sell you. Got this cloth, I'll send you. Got this dollar bill that I'll send you. And if you'll sew it back times 1,000, they were after their own greed. What they were doing is they were decimating the bride of Jesus Christ. They were exploiting His bride. Can you imagine as a loving father if, uh, and husband, if you're here this morning, is that, can you imagine your outrage at someone who might want to exploit your bride? Exploitation for their own greed. That, I think, is probably the ultimate evil. They're, they're waterless clouds. I saw yesterday, Noah and I, as we were working, we saw this big cloud that was overhead, and we thought, oh, no, we're about to get some, some rain. And I was kind of glad because we're in a little bit of a drought already. Isn't that strange? We're in a drought after all this rain. But the cloud passed over, driven by the wind, and didn't drop a drop of rain. It, it, it appeared to be as though it might bring some nourishing water. But the wind carried it away, and really it was just empty air. It, it didn't have any substance to it. That's the way he describes them. They're fruitless in late autumn, meaning there's, they, they're like a fruit tree that you plant, but it never bears any fruit. You ever planted a fruit tree, and you, you love it, you labor over it, but it never bears any fruit. It's frustrating. Somebody brought me a bag of figs this week. I love figs. But I had a fig tree at a place we rented when we first came back here to, uh, to Conyers, and, and it was a big fruit, big fig tree. And can I tell you that if a fig tree doesn't bear fruit, it's just an ugly, overgrown weed. <laughs> it's the description he gives there of them. Fruitless trees, twice dead. Twice dead. Here's what he means by this. We know we're all dead in our trespasses of sin, Right? that we are born separated from God, born dead. That's why Jesus said you must be born again. And these individuals, they come into it, and they are born dead, but they're born dead twice because they have not really had a transformed life through faith in Christ, and they think they're alive, but they're only dead. They're worse off. They're twice dead. And he goes on to say, uprooted. Wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame. Wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. Now, that's kind of the, the, the outcome of that. Now, let's look back at the three examples that he uses from the Old Testament to describe how these individuals are, and let's see what they were. He says they're of the way of Cain. We know who Cain was. There was Cain and Abel, the two firstborn ch children of Adam and Eve. And, and, and Cain offers to God a sacrifice, and it's the first fruits of his garden. 
But Abel offers a sacrifice, and it's the first fruits of his what? His livestock. They'd understood and known that their, a sacrifice to God had to have the shedding of blood, indicating there would be a shedding of blood for the remission of sin. But Cain in that, he offered that sacrifice to God. The writer of Hebrews tells, it, tells us that he did not offer it in faith. You see, anything that we offer to God must be offered in faith. God doesn't want our service. God doesn't want our check. God God doesn't want anything from us. What need does He have for anything from us except to be coupled by faith? And so Cain offers that. And God was displeased by Cain's offering. He rejected Cain's offering, and He accepted Abel's offering. Cain, full of jealousy and envy, decided in his heart that because God had accepted Abel's offering, that out of jealousy, envy, rage, he goes out and he murders Abel. So Cain's sin was was murder. But can I propose to you that it began before that? Because God comes to Cain and says, hey, Cain, I'm paraphrasing here, I know what's in your heart. I know that you're jealous and you're envious, but can I warn you, you know what's right to do and don't do it. And Cain rejected the Word of God. Cain rejected the authority of God. Cain rejected the fact that there are consequences to rebellion against God, and he went ahead and slain Abel. Cain had put him in a cell, he has put himself in a place where he didn't really believe that there was any, any authority of a holy and just God. And he says these two are the very same way. You see, Cain was enslaved, if you will, by his own self-love. The second illustration he uses is that of the way of Balaam. You can find this story in Numbers chapter 2 to 24. But you know the story of Balaam. And Balaam was a prophet in the day, and it was not very uncommon that prophets would be hired by by kings to come in and prophesy for them in certain ways. And it appeared that that Balaam was really a prophet of God, and that, that when Balaam prophesied things, they happened. And so the king... Balak, the king of Moab, sends out those to solicit Balaam to come and prophesy for him that they might defeat the children of Israel. And you know when, Cain, when Balaam's on the way, the, dog, the angel stands in front of the donkey, and the donkey turns around to speak. I would make a joke there, but I won't. The indication of the story is, is that Balaam, as a prophet of God, had prostituted himself out to the highest bidder, bidder, B-I-D-D-E-R, and was willing to take whatever it was, even to dismiss the Word of God so that he might prophesy what those with itching ears wanted him to say. Paul warns us of that in the book of Timothy. He says, in the last days, the body of Christ, the people would gather around themselves, people, teachers, to teach only what their itching ears desire to hear. So it was with these guys. They had discounted the truth of the Word of God to preach a message for payment for their own greed, for their own purses, not given any account that God has all authority and His Word has all authority. And we see that today. That's why I've said this message is so relevant to today. That where there are those who may start out in the right way, but they realize that, man, if, if, if I just start preaching a little bit more health, wealth, and prosperity, if I, if I begin to preach a little bit more only about Jesus' love and I, and I discount the judgment of God, if I remove the cross from the sanctuary, if, if I do all of these things, if I play Van Halen as an opening worship song, all of this kind of stuff, then it's going to bring more folks in. And you know what happens when you bring more folks in? You get more money in the coffer. 
That's what they were doing. But let me remind you that I think the reason that, that Jesus is so, and Jesus spoke a lot about these false prophets, that he's so enraged about it, because it's his bride. It, it's his sheepfold, and he loves the sheep. And, and, but he sees them being exploited, and, and Jude writes to this. The last one that he uses is, is that illustration of Korah. Numbers chapter 16, you can go and read the story. Korah himself was in the priestly order, but he answered to Moses and Aaron. But Korah decided in his heart that he didn't want to be under the authority of Moses and Aaron, and he wanted to gather around himself other people that would come and rebel against God's appointed leader and wanted to carry them along the way in that, and God judged him because of that rebellion against authority. Underline this, that any time there's someone who is rebellious against authority, they will always try to find other folks to join them. It begins with a whisper here, and it begins with a whisper there. And next thing you know, there's this body of individuals, and this is exactly what happened. At the core, at the root of that, was his desire for power, his desire for his own place. And he had recognized that God had placed Moses and Aaron there, and he thought that he could gather enough of the membership, if you will. Let me get 51%. And we'll come against Moses and Aaron. God said, I'm going to judge it. And I love Moses. I love this heart about Moses. Even though Moses was the one being victimized or being come against in this, Moses bows and he intercedes for Korah and those that were following after him. Isn't that great? If I had been Moses, I'd say, yeah, Lord, wipe them out. Moses intercedes, and God says, no, I can't let this go. The account says that the earth swallowed up Korah and all of those that had come along. The point is that just as God judged Korah, God will also judge these apostates. Can I kind of give you a, in parentheses here, if, here, here's a marker for me in my life to see whether or not I am of the heart of Korah. If I'm ever sitting listening to somebody, if I'm ever watching anybody else in leadership, and I have the idea, you know, I think I can do that better, or I want their place, I have to have a check in my heart to say, boy, I am being driven by something other than the Spirit of God. I am being driven by my own greed and my own ego, and I better watch out. Amen? And see, we can make that application anywhere, any place in our lives, not only in authority in the body of Christ, but we can make that application in our vocation. We can make that application in our family. Any time that there is undesired ego and greed for power, it is a dangerous place. Let me close. The three examples, again, he uses, like Cain, He was devoid of love, like Balaam, driven by greed, exploiting others, like Korah, hungry for power, and insubordinate. My message to the body would be, look for these marks. In these times of difficult times, we're reaching for answers, but be careful where you reach for answers, because there are all manners of apostates out there, all over the airwaves. Be discerning. Know the Word of God. If it, if it glitters, it ain't always gold, right? I'm going to ask the worship team to come lead us and then in closing responses to the Word this morning. Then Pastor Jeff is going to come and lead us in communion. And uh, we'll be dismissed after that. I would encourage you to take this time of worship, to not only to worship Him, but, but reflect on the truth of the gospel, that God sent His Son, Jesus, to redeem you and me. And He shed His blood and His body was broken so that we might have the forgiveness of sin. Contend for the faith, the truth, the whole truth of the gospel. If you did not receive a communion cup when you came in uh, during these 
couple of songs of worship. I want you to just raise your hand and uh, one of the ushers will bring you a communion cup. They are prepackaged communion cups. I explained last week why we had to use these. And, um, by the way, it's been the first time we've been able to have communion as a body together so in about 22 weeks. It'll be a sweet time. There are two layers to this. One is to get the bread. And then the other layer is to get the juice. And so just be aware of that and prepare your hearts for communion as the worship team leads us. Heavenly Father, God, we bow before you this morning, Lord. And God, we ask for you to unveil any sin in our lives, God, that we may be blinded to, God. Father, that you would deal with us, God, that we would lay it down at your feet, Father. Father, we love you. We worship you. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's face and sin chapter 9, starting in verse 12. 
He entered the most holy place once for all, not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, having attained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls of a young sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more and serve the living God. Oh, how could it be that my God would welcome me into this mystery? Say, take this bread, take this wine, now the simple may divine for any to receive. By your mercy we come to your table, by your grace you are making us faithful, Lord we remember you, and remembrance leads us to worship, and as we worship you. Worship leads to communion. We respond to your invitation. We remember you. See his body, his blood. Know that he has overcome every trial we will face. And none too lost to be saved, none too broken or ashamed, all are welcome in this place. By your mercy we come to your table. By your grace, you are making us faithful. Lord, we remember you. And remembrance leads us to worship. And as we worship you, our worship leads to communion we respond to your invitation we remember you and dying you destroyed our death rising you restored
together. I want us to look at this maybe a little bit different than we normally do, but don't get nervous. It's all biblical. First, let me read to you Luke 22, 8, 13, 19, and 20. It says this, So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. And they went and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Everybody say new. New covenant in my blood. So, he sent two of his best guys to go prepare this Passover meal for them to eat that night. But Jesus was preparing to do something different. He was preparing to do something new, to change forever the way these guys looked at this meal and to prepare them for what was to come. The Passover meal was instituted by God to remind his people of what he had done for them, protecting them from death and freeing them from Egypt. But what Jesus was about to do was going to protect people from death by freeing them from sin. The meaning of this symbolic supper forever changed because of what Jesus was doing in the present. It changed from remember what God did for you then to remember what God is doing for you now. We often get so caught up in the past. We miss what's happening in the present and what we have to look forward to in the future. This is God's message to us today. It's okay to look back, to learn, to grieve, to celebrate, but we can't get stuck there. God doesn't want us to live in the past. We want to be present and aware in the moment today to see what God is up to now, knowing it could change everything for us going forward. And then we need to look, at the, look to the future with excitement and expectation, anticipating that the best is always yet to come. I believe we find ourselves in a similar place today, a place with many changes happening and much being different. Today, like then, God is still at work and wants to do so much more in us and with us and through us. But if we're not careful, we'll miss it. So as we boldly go forward into these new days, we can be confident knowing that God is still with us. His sacrifice is still effective in producing results and that he's not finished yet. Yes, things may look different. Things may be different. Things may be new. But that doesn't mean worse are less important. In fact, when God comes to change things, it means it's only getting better. So we'll continue to look back and remember. We'll continue to look back and celebrate God's faithfulness, God's goodness, but we won't stay stuck there. The past is kind of like California. It's a great place to go visit, but you don't want to live there. So we have to be mindful of the moment, in the moment, so that we don't miss what he has for us and wants to do right here and right now. And then, yes, we will look forward to the future, not with fear, but in faith, knowing he's coming back soon for all of those who are his. So we celebrate the past. We look forward to the future, but we live in the present to please him. 
Father, may our observance of you this morning be pleasing to you, and may each of us be right with you and each other. God, and if that's not the case, I pray that you would help us do whatever we need to do to fix that while we have time. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. In order for it to be better, it has to be different. Father, thank you for not leaving us stuck in the past. Thank you that we are no longer bound in sin because of what you did for us. But God, thank you for changing things and making us new. Thank you that with you, the best is always yet to come. Amen. Let's stand together and sing this song of celebration before we leave this morning. Lost without hope with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained My orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance when death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace, so oh, free Washes over me You have made me new Now life began to win you It's your chains I'm a prisoner no more my shame was a ransom he faithfully bore he canceled my debt and he called me his friend when death was arrested in my life began oh your grace so oh, free washes over
laid on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hell. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over. his and that you have been made free from the bondage of sin don't leave here today without knowing that he loves you we love you may the lord bless you may he keep you may his face shine upon you and do not forget the love offering for jamie and blake on your way out you are dismissed have a wonderful sunday